Yeah, I've, I've got it. I got it worked out. Good morning. It is good to see you all. Those of you uh, on Facebook or Zoom, glad to have you with us. And those of you that braved uh, some of the cold weather, good to have you out here in the sanctuary. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you'd uh, find the red books somewhere on your uh, on your uh, on your row, please uh, give us a. Uh, your name, so that we'll know that uh, we'll know you're here. If you're on uh, if you're on Facebook, you can uh, go to the website and hit communications and let us know that you're here. The um, if you're on Facebook, what follows us? We didn't uh, we didn't endorse that uh, or direct it. And then if you lose feed while you're watching on Zoom or Facebook, the the program is uh, has been uh, uh, recorded, and you can go you can go to the website and find it under video uh, services. And again, hit uh, communications in the header. That'll show you a number of things. If you're um, if you're a guest on Facebook, you can go uh, you can go to communications and uh, let us know who you are, and also get whatever uh, you need. If you're uh, if you're a guest here, uh, if you're new with us, take a white card out and fill it out and put it in the uh, put it in the offering plate when it uh, comes when it comes by. On uh, oh today at noon. Yesterday we had our planning meeting, and apparently there was a glitch between uh, myself and the caterer, and they thought the lunch was for today, but it, it was supposed to be for supposed to be for yesterday. So we have a lunch of uh, ham, scalloped potatoes, uh, chicken pot pie, apple cobbler, cranberry bars, uh, kale salad, green beans, uh, as well as uh, some other nice things. Um, we have a we have a lunch for 40 people. Uh, so uh, basically. Uh, Make your, it's really, really nice lunch. Uh, make your way down there if you would like a lunch. Uh, I've first, first 40 there. Uh, I would, maybe it would serve even more than that. Uh, but I would love for that. I'd love for some of you, if you would be willing to gather. Uh, we'll just enjoy, we'll enjoy that nice lunch uh, today. So it's available. It'll be in the fellowship hall right after, right after we're done. Uh, on Monday, uh, Women's Bible Study, Chess Club and Debbie Myers Circle. Tuesday, is MOPS, Tuesday Bible Study, Finance Team, uh, Wednesday, uh, the ORF, Ch Youth and Children Musical Groups Practice, there's uh, dinner at 5, and then uh, our annual meeting will be this Wednesday night, and uh, we, will, we will look in Revelation, I'll have a Bible study in Revelation, but we'll also look over our annual report, and you can get a copy of this out in the Narthex, and we also have a new directory, uh, that there's some out in the Narthex, and we'll make more We'll make more available. Um, mission lunch coming up the end of uh, Janu January um, on the 29th. A Peru mission trip is coming together. Celebration ringers will practice again soon. Marriage course. Um, I think they have like two, two open slots. So if you know somebody, yeah. Okay, child care. And meal prep still is a need for the for the uh, different nights that we do at marriage course. Uh, divorce care, grief share coming back online soon, and loss of spouse seminar is uh, is coming up. And then one last uh, one last thing before we share a song, and that is uh, as people are coming back, our uh, our parking lot is is filling up. You would think that uh, you'd, you'd think that we'd have enough parking, but uh, I know last week. The, our executive minister was here, and Mike told me he said I drove through the lot and there was not a there was not a place to park, so he parked in the guest parking. So uh, this is a this is a an announcement from before COVID. We're bringing it back. If you are if you are physically able, if you can park uh, away from the church and walk back, it uh, it opens up a a parking space where. Uh, 
a lot of times people are going to check a church out and they drive through the lot and there's no place to park and then they, they just kind of head on. They, they don't know where to park and how to come back. So uh, if that relates to you, if you're able to, if you're able just to park away and come back, you get some steps in and you free up a, <laughs> you free up a, a space. Uh, keep, that, keep that in mind. All right, we're going we're gonna to sing uh, Stand in Your Love. We sang part of it last week, and if you're able to, uh, to join us, please do. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to my lies. I'm not afraid to leave the past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Well, there's power that can break off every chain. Well, there's power that can empty out a grave. Well, there's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Next song we're going to sing is a familiar hymn and uh, we're looking at the church of Sardis and they had a reputation for being alive but Jesus says you're dead. And anytime we get away from the cross and the gospel, we lose, we lose life. So uh, join me with uh, Jesus keep me near the cross. Jesus keep me near the cross that a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mouth
Father, we're so thankful that we could uh, be involved in this worship service today, whether we're here in person or, or online. Um, we are together in worshiping you. And where there is deadness or where we've drifted from you or where we've fallen asleep, help us to hear Jesus' words to the Christians in Sardis, that we need to wake up and to strengthen what remains. Move by your spirit in our midst as David plays, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand with me? The response of reading this morning is from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Join me in singing our hymn. <clears throat> Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease. in praise of you, our sovereign God. May we never take for granted that you are here in our midst, desiring for us to humbly love and serve your people. On this Sunday, we remember your servant, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who spent his life teaching us that only through love can we right the wrongs of this world. We, in our weakness, are prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, prone to leave the God we love. Help us, dear Father, so that we may say to you, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. May we pray earnestly now that perfect prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take a minute and spread the love of Jesus with one another. Good morning, guys. How are you? Good. Okay, I'm going to have to use my teacher voice because I'm going to use my hands here for a minute. So I'm going to turn this off, but you'll still be able to hear me, okay? See, being a teacher, you don't need a microphone. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Samuel, I have a question for you. Does Daddy love you? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you. you have a child that you'd like to uh, have in the children's church, they need to rise up and, and uh, head out. Um, yesterday we had a planning meeting and then uh, the meeting ended with a presentation by uh, Ed Rogers and Bill Brown. They're part of a, a group that our, um, our denomination, uh, the West Virginia Baptist Convention, is encouraging uh, churches to go through this uh, renew process. And uh, it looks like we're going we're gonna to plow ahead with it. Uh, it's going to involve you in that uh, one of the key components is uh, 
everyone that we're everyone that we can is going to go online and take a uh, take a survey, and that survey is going to ask you questions about uh, the church, uh, various aspects of it, and then they take that information as well as some of our um, minutes and from our meetings, and they interview uh, interview staff and other people, and they come up with some ideas of ways that we might become more effective. So. Um, we are going to, I think we're going to plow ahead with that, so you'll be hearing more, more about that. One thing I told the leaders yesterday, two things, and I, we have a slide for the first one here, uh, actually for both of them, and that is uh, as we as a church try to come together and really be a church family, last year I think we had about 20 people do a table of life, which is simply having um, some people over for a meal. Uh, very, it's not rocket science, um, you you host a meal, you invite a few people you know, and then if you have an extra uh, chair or two at the table, you can call us and we'll give you an idea of some, someone you may invite. And everyone that's had a table of life came back and said it was just a very enjoyable time. And they said, now when I see those people at church, we've shared a meal together and we talked about things and we have something to talk about. So it's, it's made our fellowship deeper. So I want you to Pray about that in the new year. We're going to be talking about it. It's a real practical way that, that we can make connections. And then my hope is, is that the relationships that might begin to develop around the table would go, and the next slide uh, reminds you of uh, life groups. And life groups are simply groups that meet uh, in a home, and a lot of times they're simply based on a topic of interest, like if uh, you wanted to study biblical financial management. You, uh, you're willing to maybe host that or someone else you know will host that. The church will help you with the material. We'll also help you with some people that might be interested in attending. And you make a commitment for like five to six weeks uh, to get together. It uh, doesn't have to be every week. Some groups meet every other week. But we have about four or five life groups that currently meet, and people who, who are part of those feel, feel better connected, and uh, it's very biblical because that's kind of how the early church Met. So tables of life and life groups are things that we're going to talk about as we uh, look at our renewal of a manual and we do this into the, into the new year. We're going to receive our offering now. Uh, for those of you at home, uh, a lot of you uh, send, your, send your gifts in. There's the address and uh, others can go to the uh, website and hit, uh, hit give and you can give online. As the offering is being collected, I want to show you a, a video, kind of a background to the Revelation passage that we're going to look at today. It's the Bible Project video on Revelation, and uh, I'll stop you up there when we're done. So let us give as unto the Lord. The book of the Revelation of Jesus. The author of this book, which is not called Revelations, by the way, is named at the beginning. It was written by John which could refer to the beloved disciple who wrote the gospel and the letters of John, or it could be a different John, a messianic Jewish prophet who traveled about and taught in the early church. Whichever John it was, he makes clear in the opening paragraph what kind of book he has written. He calls it, first of all, a revelation or apocalypse. The Greek word is apokalypsis, and it refers to a type of literature very familiar to John's readers from the Hebrew scriptures and from other popular Jewish texts. Apocalypse has recounted a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions that revealed God's heavenly perspective on history and current events so that the present could be viewed in light of history's final outcome. And John says this apocalypse is a prophecy, which means it's a word from God spoken through a prophet to God's people, usually to warn or comfort them in a time of crisis. By calling this book a prophecy, John's saying that it stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets and is bringing their message to a climax. And this apocalyptic prophecy was sent to real people that John knew. The book opens and closes as a circular letter that was sent to seven churches in the ancient Roman province of Asia. Now, seven is a meaningful number for John. It's a symbol of completeness based on the seven-day Sabbath cycle in the Old Testament. And John has woven sevens into every single part of this book. Now, with this opening, John has given us clear guidance about how he wants us to understand this book. Jewish apocalypse is communicated through symbolic imagery and numbers. It is not a secret predictive code about the timing of the end of the world. Rather, John is constantly using these symbols that are drawn from the Old Testament, and he expects his readers to go discover what the symbols mean by looking up the text he's alluding to. 
Also, the fact that it's a letter means that John is actually addressing the situation of these first century churches. And so while this book has much to say to Christians of later generations, the book's meaning must first be anchored in the historical context of John's time, place, and audience. Which brings us into the book's first section, Jesus' message to the seven churches. John was exiled on the island of Patmos, and he saw a vision of the risen Jesus, exalted as king of the world. And he was standing among seven burning lights. And John's told this is a symbol of the seven churches in Asia Minor that's been adapted from the book of the prophet Zechariah. And Jesus starts addressing the specific problems that face each church. Some were apathetic due to wealth and affluence. Others were morally compromised. Their people were still eating ritual meals and sleeping around in pagan temples. But others among the churches remained faithful to Jesus, and they were suffering harassment and even violent persecution. And Jesus warns that things are going to get worse. A tribulation is upon the churches that will force them to choose between compromise or faithfulness. By John's day, the murder of Christians by the Roman Emperor Nero was passed, and the persecution of Christians by Emperor Domitian was likely underway. And so the temptation was to deny Jesus, either to avoid persecution or simply to join the spirit of the Roman age. And Jesus calls them to faithfulness so that they can overcome or literally conquer. And Jesus promises a reward for everyone in these churches who does conquer. Each reward is drawn directly from the book's final vision about the marriage of heaven and earth. And so this opening section, it sets up the main plot tension that will drive the storyline in this book. Will Jesus' people endure? Will they inherit the new world that God has in store? And why is faithfulness to Jesus described as conquering? The rest of the book is John's answer. That's After good. this, John has a vi Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. pray. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. O God, we thank you for the privilege of giving, of sharing whatever small amount that we have. We ask that you take it, multiply it, and use it to grow your kingdom here on earth. May we always remember that what we have is actually yours, and we are but stewards of your bounty. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As we take a time for uh, praise and prayer, I uh, want to praise God that there's almost uh, 300 students at uh, Parchment Valley for uh, what they call snow camp. Um, some of our own um, students are there. Delbert, uh, Delbert Casto is in the midst of them. I texted him last night, and he said it's, uh, it's been going uh, really, really well. But I'm sure a lot of them have been challenged to, to think about their faith and maybe rededicate, or, or maybe some of them are, are being challenged for a first-time commitment. So let's really pray that as this snow camp is uh, kind of coming together this morning that God blesses. If you're on uh, Facebook or Zoom, and you uh, want to pass along a prayer concern, go to the website, hit contact us, and uh, that comes directly to me, and we'll, we'll add it uh, to, uh, to our prayer list. Um, some folks to keep in, in, in prayer, uh, Terry Ash, uh, Jan Ashwell, Jean Beatty, uh, Steve and Dina Deem, uh, Gretchen Fleming, Randy Halterman, Ed Huffman, Shirley Huffman, uh, Tom Molson, Don McCloy, Barb Nichols, John Nicholson, Rita Sterling, and Karen Van Oster, uh, just some, you can read the, the specifics. All of them are looking at tests or about to do some tests and have some uncertainty. Uh, and let's just pray the Lord would, uh, would, be, would be with them uh, in, the, in the days to come. Any other, uh, any other concerns or, or prayers that you'd like to add? 
just saw this, and I meant to mention it. People have made donations, and we have about 40 of these prayer bears, and they're on the front pew. The idea is, is giving somebody a tangible gift when they're going through a tough time can be really meaningful. And so all of these have a little tag on them saying that this comes to you from Emmanuel. You're in our thoughts and prayers, and uh, this comes to, a, comes to you as a gift. So uh, we used to buy just like the exact same kind from a supplier and now people have kind of donated ones that they have so there's a variety up here of different uh, different kinds but every Sunday these are up there on the front pew if you can think of someone that might uh, might like it take it and uh, and pass it pass it on to them as we go to prayer let's uh, let's sing together And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died. Take away my sin, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Father, we come into your presence and we, we come in with praise. You are a great God and we look back over our lives and even though we've struggled and today may be a really tough day for us, whether we're online or, or here in person, there may be just a number of things that have uh, caused us concern and we're feeling anxiety and, and fear as we think about what comes next. But Father, the message of Revelation is that even in the midst of very difficult times, you are there with your people. Uh, you minister them by your angels. Your spirit is constantly moving in their midst. And even if the worst happens, even if we are uh, killed for our faith or even if we die, uh, Father, as Christians, we know that our eyes close on earth and they open in a new reality of light and love and laughter, and we'll see Jesus face to face, and we will be healed and whole and happy and home. Father, that is our hope, and that means that we can live freely uh, because nothing can ultimately affect us. They may kill our body, but you have our soul, and we are thankful for that today. We, we gather to worship to give you praise, to remember many are in need, many are wondering what to do next, and they need a kind word, they need some wisdom, they need someone just to take time to, to listen to them. So help us to be available to one another. May we be a, 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 a giving church family. I pray that tables of life might, might come out of our fellowship this year where we sit, simply gather around a table, enjoy good food and conversation. And then I'm praying, Father, that uh, a life group, uh, people might begin to gather together uh, around a, a biblical uh, topic that is of interest, and we will learn how to grow together as your family. So we ask that you'll continue to guide us, and we're grateful for this time. Be with all those that are calling out to you today, and we offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we thank you for uh, the choir and the, the, uh, the music that they sing reminds us that there is a heavenly choir even now uh, singing praises before your throne. Thank you for the music that they provide. And we pray that every time we gather, we will sing praises unto you. Uh, that our, it would set our spirits uh, right, puts us in the right frame of mind, that we might be able to better uh, hear your word to us through scripture. So continue to move in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we uh, look at another of the seven uh, churches today, uh, we'll find that the, the statement that Jesus makes about the church in Sardis is that he says, you, you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. They, they're, they appear to be alive, but they're not really real. And as I reflected on that, it reminded me of the uh, story of the Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams. It's a story about a toy rabbit who wanted to be a real rabbit. And one day, uh, the young rabbit and an old skin horse were talking together in the nursery. What is real, asked the rabbit of the skin horse just before Nana came to pick up the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you or a stick-out handle? Real is not how you're made, said the skin horse. It's something that happens to you when a child loves you for a long time, not just to play with, but really loves you. Then you become real. Does it hurt, asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, that's why it doesn't happen to people who break easily or have to be carefully kept. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, asked the rabbit. It doesn't happen all at once. You become, generally by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, your eyes drop out, you're loose in the joints, and you become very shabby looking. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. Um, I love that image, and to me, it's a reminder of what we're supposed to be about as a church. We are supposed to, by, love, by loving one another, we love each other into reality. And by the time we are real, <laughs> we may have all of our hair rubbed off, and we may be loose in the joints and look very shabby. Uh, but we're not ugly, because we're real, and we're alive. Uh, really alive. So I want to give you uh, a few slides. Uh, you've watched the video, but a few other just background slides for Revelation. I believe the Apostle John uh, wrote it. He's in prison on an island in Patmos. You saw the literary genre is apocalyptic, which has means unveiling something that uh, we can't see. The date's around uh, 95 AD. Uh, there's Roman persecution going on. Uh, emperors desired worship, as well as all kinds of false gods that are being worshipped. And the purpose of Revelation is to encourage the weak to hang on, challenge the faithful to stay strong, reveal that there are invisible spiritual battle, there's a battle going on, and to give assurance of final victory. And then another background slide. This one did not come out right. But Christ is the center of everything in Revelation. Chapter 1, we see Christ risen and ruling. 2 and 3, Christ is head over his church. 4 and 5, Christ is worshipped in heaven. Um, and then in 6 to 18, Christ is in control in the midst of chaos. 19 to 20, Christ returns to right all wrongs. And then 21, 22, Christ rules over a new heaven and new earth. And so at every point, John is pointing us back uh, to, to Christ, who is the center of reality. And then there are, I showed you the slide last week, these seven churches of Asia Minor. Paul is on Patmos, this island just offshore where there was a Roman prison where if someone spoke out uh, for their faith or against the emperor, they either killed them or they put you in these uh, prison colonies, and it's there he gets the vision. And the first, the first letter went to Ephesus, and last week we looked at the church of Ephesus, and you remember they did many things and they maintained purity, but they had forsaken their first love, and they needed to turn back to the Lord. And many people feel that Ephesus was the epicenter and that they probably planted these other churches uh, were planted out of Ephesus. That's one speculation. And so uh, it's probably a mail route. Uh, a mail carrier would go in that circular route. And today we're looking at the uh, church of, of Sardis. And so we are going to look together at um, Revelation 3 
verses 1 through uh, 6. Revelation 3, 1 through 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and, uh, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot their name out of the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so the first slide here is just the words Jesus says, uh, I am the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And so just... Jesus is always mentioning his care for the church. And so when he says, I hold the seven spirits, seven is, a, is the number of completeness. He's saying, I have complete knowledge. The spirit is in me fully, and I am fully aware of what is happening around you and in you because the seven stars, I also hold them. And those are the angels that guide and direct the churches. And so Jesus is simply saying, I am fully alert, fully informed, and completely aware of everything that is going on. You may think that people, that no one knows you or is watching you, but I am. Uh, the image that came to me is my, my mom when I was little. Moms somehow know where all the kids are, even though they're nowhere close. And so mom would yell from the first floor, Get out of that closet on the second floor or whatever. She wasn't there. She couldn't see. Somehow moms know. They just have this inner sense of what's going on everywhere because they, they just have that sense. And so Jesus, in a much greater sense, says, I know. I hold the seven spirits, and I'm holding the seven stars, and I have everything. And by the way, Jesus is overflowing with the spirit, which is the one thing that Sardis appears to need because they are dead. They are spiritually dead. And Jesus says, I've got what you need. Call out to me. Uh, next slide says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the pattern of all these letters, and the next slide is the letter, the pattern, they all start with an image of Christ from the first chapter. There's, there is a compliment, a criticism, and a correction. Jesus compliments them. He says, here's what I'm concerned about, the criticism, and then there's, here's how you fix it, and then there's an image of heaven from the final chapters. What is interesting is in Sardis and in Laodicea, there's no compliment. There, uh, it, uh, Jesus goes straight to criticism in Sardis and Laodicea, and if you look at Jesus's compliments, they have to do with the conflict that the churches were having with the culture. And so all the other churches, when Jesus compliments them, he's saying to them, you are standing up against everything that the culture is throwing at you. There are, there's false Jewish teaching. There's false teaching about gods. There are, there are Romans that tell you you have to worship the emperor as Lord. And every other church, Jesus compliments them for standing and being in conflict with the culture. And so my speculation is Sardis is not complimented because Sardis is not feeling any conflict from the culture. They, they have learned to get along and go along. You know, a little sexual immorality here, you know, who really knows about it? I mean, it's, it's a temple prostitute, not a big deal. You can go about your life. Uh, go ahead, worship the emperor, just a little pinch of incense uh, into the flame, and you go about your business. And so there is a sense that I get that Sardis has kind of accommodated with or they've, they've adjusted to the culture, and so Jesus doesn't compliment them 
because in many ways maybe they've become more like the culture than they should. They're showing compassion, but they're not confessing Christ. And when I wrote that line, I instantly thought of our necessity <laughs> pantry. Um, and uh, when, uh, when Edie came to me and stepped up to take it over, I, I'll never forget what she told me. She said, um, I want to make sure that we give out the supplies that are needed. And by the way, that ministry is really expanding because we're living in a time of inflation and people, people are struggling in, to get basics. And so we're having a lot more people come by. And uh, so we need you to supply things, and we'll, and we'll take care of it. But Edie said to me, I want to give them things, things that we have, but I also want to pray with them. And I also, if possible, if they're, if they're open, I'd like to share the gospel with them. And so she and I were looking kind of in the hallway, and I saw this uh, divider, and I said, you know, for you to do that, it would be nice if we had a little space here away from the hallway. And so we set up a table and put a divider in front of it, and now on the Tuesdays that they're open, I, I notice that Edie and all those that are helping her, they, Edie's able to take the person behind the, the counter. She, she gets their order. And then I, I hear prayer. And then I hear, um, would you like to hear uh, more about uh, the Lord? Have you heard about the Lord? Do you know him? And to me, that's, that, that's the balance that we need. We need to be generous, but we also need to share the gospel, don't we? Um, I had the opportunity to, to uh, give, give somebody a jump. There was a, there was a truck that was there to pick up stuff, and the, the car, the, the, the battery was dead. So I, came, I brought my car around, and we jumped it. And I asked him about the battery, and the battery was five years old. I said, ah, let's get you. I said, let's get you a new battery. And so we went to the auto parts store. And the church, you, through the help fund, bought them a, a, a new battery. And as I was giving him the battery, I also said, you know, our church... Our church believes um, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and the reason we do this is because we've been loved, and we want to show that to people. So here's a, and I gave him just a step. We have a steps to peace with God, which is a simple description of the gospel. And so not only did we get that, get that family uh, battery, because he said it, it was going dead like every other time when they traveled around, but we also, we also showed them what we believe. And to me, when I imagine Sardis, I, I picture them doing a lot of good things, and they got a reputation from the community for doing good work, but they, maybe they were not also confessing the reason they did it, which was Jesus Christ. So the next slide is, what, what does Jesus say? He says, wake up, strengthen what, what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God. Uh, it's gold in geography. Uh, just interesting as I was studying, uh, Sardis was a trade center. They made uh, wool garments, which were highly prized in that day. So that was a big deal. But they also had a gold mine that was very productive. And Sardis was one of the few towns that minted gold coins for the empire. It was an incredibly wealthy place. And what, what happens when people get money? What happens often to their spiritual life? Sometimes the more money you get, the less you think about God. And Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You either serve God or money. Jesus said his number one rival was when money becomes your God. So pray for that person in Maine who won the $1.3 billion. <laughs> They're going to that Maine town trying to find uh, some uh, one ticket, won the $1.3 million. I'm going to call him up and see if he'd like a friend uh, just to come alongside. Uh, the other thing about Sardis, which is interesting, uh, and maybe this is interesting to me, but maybe not to you. Look at the geography of Sardis. Uh, this is the later town, but the first, uh, the first town of Sardis was literally built into a mountain so that the walls around the city dropped 1,500 feet. Um, and so it was very, very difficult for uh, invading armies like Persia came to invade it. Greece came later to invade it. Both of them were successful, and it's interesting how they were successful. Apparently, a Persian soldier around 549 B.C. was, was watching, and there was a, a, a soldier of, of, from the town of Sardis, and he dropped his helmet over the wall, and it went down to the bottom, the, the soldier of Sardis didn't think anybody was watching, so he scaled down the wall, and then there was a special way that they had learned how to go back up the wall. 
The Persian soldier memorized how he did it, saw the handholds that no one else saw, and the Persian soldier took a, a regiment and they were able to scale the wall, and when they got up to the top and they peered over the wall, this is a Roman historian who wrote this, they found all of the soldiers of Sardis asleep because no one had ever scaled the wall. I mean, they were too high up there, so they didn't expect to ever be attacked. And when they scaled the wall, the people in Sardis were asleep. So the, the, uh, the statement of those people, the Persian says, we conquered while you slept. And so what does Jesus say to Sardis? Remember your history. You slept when you should have been awake. And because you slept, you were overcome by outside forces. You didn't think anyone was going to come for you, but the Persians came for you and, and you were asleep. The Greeks came for you and you were asleep. And he said, most importantly, I'm coming like a thief in the night and you better be ready. Uh, you, <laughs> uh, Siri's trying to gonna look up thief in the night for me. Uh, and, uh, I'll get, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, so the problem, uh, the problem in Sardis is hypocrisy. They appeared to be alive, but they were dead. Other people admired their programs, their activities, their service. They had money, they had talent, they had resources. They looked alive, but they were dead. And this all week long, I thought about this idea that outward appearances can be deceptive, and we need to always be thinking, God, do I appear alive on the outside? Who am I really on the inside? I think of the people who um, invested money with Sam F Bankman Freed or whatever, the Bitcoin guy that, yeah, boy, it looked like a great investment. You're going to get a lot of money back. Turned out it was all a scam, $32 billion just away. It looked good, but, but it was but it wasn't, it wasn't real. Uh, twice a year, we get this letter from Domain Registry, and it says that your, uh, your domain name for your church, ours is EBCWV, uh, it, it needs to be uh, renewed, and you need to send us $300. And it, looks, it, it, all, it all looks legitimate. Well, the problem is, is our we pay for our domain name ten, for ten, 10 years at a time. It's a, it's a scam. And I'm sure a lot of people open this up. They don't want to lose their website, and so they send in the check. It looks real, but, but it's not. And so we are reminded in Scripture that you can look good on the outside but be dead on the inside. And Sardis had acquired a reputation with people but not with God. As we learn in Scripture, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Isaiah said of some of the Israelites, he said, these people come near to me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And those are the same words that Jesus used to describe the Pharisees in his day. He said in Matthew 23, woe to you teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You are whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. You you look, you look white and pure on the outside, but inside you're dead. Which, by the way, that doesn't seem to be the way to grow a church, does it? <laughs> you know, just to tell people, you are dead, completely dead. You look white on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones. He's trying, he was trying to wake them up to their reality. By the, word, by the way, the word hypocrite literally means an actor wearing a mask on a stage playing a part. And Jesus said, I don't want you to wear a mask and play a part. I want you to really believe in me. I want you to really serve me. So uh, just some thoughts. How can we appear to be alive but really be dead? Three thoughts came to mind, and I'll just share them, share them briefly. One is the reality of sin. Uh, second is the power of culture. And the third is the ease of autopilot. First uh, is the reality of sin. Jesus called the Christians in Sardis to repent. That means that they had sin that they needed to repent of. And we learn in Ephesians 2 where Paul says, We were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God who is full of love and rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
So what happens when there's sin in our life? We, we die inside. The best way that I know to think about sin is think of the word. It's S-I-N. What's the letter in the middle of the word sin? I. Sin is all about I, me, mine. This is what I want. This is what I need. And when, when we come to God, we lose thinking about what I want, and we begin to say, God, what, does, what do you want? Jesus' prayer on the last night of his life is a model prayer. What is it? Not my will, but your will be done. That's, that's what it means to be saved. And so salvation is where that eye of sin is replaced by the cross, and God takes center stage. Sin is not something we can manage with willpower. It's a consuming addiction. Sin means we fall, we fail, we come up short, we miss the mark, and we, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because there is sin in you and me, it's possible for us to appear alive on the outside but be dead on the inside. So here's what I think about the, the one point I want to make here is that Christianity is not that you are a bad person and with a little bit of effort you can become a good person. Christian theology says you're dead and your only hope is for the power of God's spirit to resurrect you into life. And you simply have to say, God, I need you. I, I can't do this myself. And when you pray that prayer, God comes in and does a work. Sin leads to, to lies, deception. We rationalize, we minimize, we blame other people. We live in the dark. But Jesus says, come into the light. I am the light of the world, and those who believe in me will never walk in darkness. So we appear to be alive, but we're dead because of sin. Secondly, I think we appear to be alive, but we're dead because a lot of us have just adapted to the culture. Remember that Jesus did not compliment Sardis, and it's very likely because they were not in conflict at all with the culture. Jesus complimented the other churches because they were taking a stand against the things that the culture was saying were good, and the church would come back and say, we love you, but we don't, we don't believe that. And that caused tension and conflict, and Jesus compliments them for taking a stand. Sardis didn't get the compliment, which meant that maybe they were just adapting to the culture. Eugene Peterson tells a story of a middle-aged Baltimore man who passed through people's lives with ease, assuming different roles as needed. There's a story about Morgan, who was uh, at a church during a fair. He's on the lawn watching a puppet show, and uh, a young man uh, comes out from behind the stage and says, um, my wife's in labor. Is there a doctor? Well, Morgan steps up and says, uh, I'm, I'm a doctor. What do you need? He says, well, she's, she's having a baby. So he puts the, the man and his wife in the car, and they take off to John Hopkins. Halfway there, the, 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 the guy from the back seat says, the baby's coming. Uh, Morgan sends uh, the guy to a convenience store to get some newspapers to, to, to be like uh, towels, delivers the baby, takes the man and the woman to the hospital, deposit them at, at the emergency room, and then he disappears. And then uh, the, the couple says, after everything's brought together, they say, hey, we want to thank Dr. Morgan because he was so helpful. And the hospital says, we don't have a Dr. Uh, Morgan. And they're like, how could you not have a Dr. Morgan? We met him and he delivered our baby. Well, uh, a couple of months later, they are strolling uh, their, their new baby down the street, and they, they see Morgan walking on the other side of the street. They run over to greet him, show him the healthy baby, and share how they couldn't believe the hospital could be so incompetent. Then Morgan, in an unusual display of honesty, admits he's not really a doctor. He runs a hardware store. But they needed a doctor, and being a doctor in such a circumstance was not all that difficult. It's an image thing, he told them. You can figure out what people expect and fit into it. You can get by with it in all the honored professions. Morgan had impersonated lawyers, pastors, doctors, and counselors. And then he confided, I would never pretend to be a plumber or a butcher. <laughs> they would catch me in a minute. Uh, I tell that story because I wonder if some of us go through life just kind of adapting or adjusting to the moment and fitting into whatever is kind of needed, and we don't really have a center. 
We don't really have a belief system that guides us. And as Christians, that means that we're just cultural chameleons. We just adapt to the surface that we're on. And if we do that, we may, ap we may appear to be alive, but I think in reality we're dead because we don't have anything that we really believe. And in one other way that we can appear alive but be dead is just to be on, just to put your life on autopilot. You just sort of, you're living day to day. You're not really thinking about much. You're not really praying. You're not really wrestling. You're just sort of getting from day to day. Um, I finally, after 11 years, bought a, uh, bought a new car a couple of months ago. And uh, I did, uh, my other car didn't have all these things. But this has the blind spot thing on the mirror. That's, that's great. Uh, it helps me see what I can't see. This car has lane assist. And that keeps you, uh, those of you that have newer cars, it keeps you between the midline and the sideline. So if you ever go, if you're, if you're going to the either line, the, 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 the wheel just kind of sh shimmies you back into the middle. And then it has adaptive cruise control, which it will, it will keep you at the same speed until you come up on a car in front of you, and then you set how many car lengths you want to be back from it, and it'll keep you two car lengths or three car lengths back. So it occurred to me that I could set my car up on 77 and head toward Charleston, put it on cruise control, and it, would, it should make it there until it runs out of gas. Which, and, and this, is just, this, is not the, this is not the fully self-driving cars, which, have you seen those videos on YouTube where people are driving down the highway and they take a video of the car next to them, it's going 70 miles an hour, and the person in the passenger seat is asleep, and the person in the driver's seat is asleep, and they're just going down the highway, and it occurred to me, it, is that you and me? Are we, are we just kind of going through life? On, uh, on autopilot. Uh, years ago, I was, uh, well, I was preaching in uh, Clarksburg, and uh, I, was, I, I was doing a dramatic monologue, and there was a lady named Lorena. She was 90 years old, and I'm, I'm the rich man in hell. And I'm calling out to God saying, you need to get me out of here. And in the middle of this dramatic monologue, Lorena, she's about three quarters of the way back, she begins to yell, turn it down. It's too loud. And I broke character, and I said, Lorena, are you okay? You okay? I said, I, I, won't, I won't be so loud, and I, and I finished up. The next day, Lorena <laughs> came into the church, and she's like 92 years old. Her sister Maria was 95. They, they were two sisters. And um, she said, I, I, think, I think something happened in church yesterday. But she said, I wanted to explain. She said, I fell asleep. And I, she said, I was dreaming. And I was home, and I was telling my sister, Maria, the television is too loud. Uh, tur turn it down. <laughs> and I, said, I said, yeah, it was kind of loud. But, uh, um, but I've always felt like I've, I've been there for people who need like an hour of sleep on, on Sunday. I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm there for you. So you can appear to be alive but really be dead because sin is in you. Because you've simply adapted to the culture, and there's really no difference between you and anyone else. And also because maybe you've just set your mind on autopilot, and you're just, going, you're just kind of going down. You're sort of going down the road, not really thinking. Okay? You can appear alive. You're moving, but are you really alive? So how does Jesus end this letter? Uh, just a good reminder. He says, what can we do? How can we come alive? He says, remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast to it and repent. And as I was, as I was preparing this message, I just, I, it just occurred to me all the different people who have spoken into my life. Remember what you have received. And can you take just a moment to give thanks for teachers, pastors, youth leaders, family members, friends, the whole scope of your life. People have been speaking into your life. And where it's been biblical and where it's been true, your spirit, the spirit in you has taken it in and it's shaped who you are. And Jesus says, hold on to that. Okay? And, and I think we always need to go back to the basics. I don't think we need to be complicated. I think we need, always just need to go back to the basics. What is it? Jesus loves me. <laughs> this I know. <laughs> For the Bible tells me so. That's pretty much it. Right there. In fact, whenever, whenever we fly, and I'm not a good flyer, 
you know, what, it, what happens pre-flight? Every flight, what do they do? They tell you how the, how the seat belt works. Everybody's tuned out. I am listening because maybe there's a new design of that seat belt. Maybe there's a little wrinkle that they haven't told us about. I'm watching. Okay, oh, okay, you lift that. Got it, got it, good. And did you know that oxygen is flowing even if that little plastic thing doesn't fill up? Did you know that? And did you know that the closest exit to you may be behind you? Okay. Everybody, everybody tunes out. But I'm, I'm listening because I want to know the important things. And so every Sunday when we gather, you know what we do? We just go back over the basics. God loves us. We're sinners. Because we're sinners, we may be dead on the inside. And we're praying. We're praying that God would, would give us life. Let me close with a quote by David Platt. He said, to be a Christian is to be loved by God, pursued by God, and found by God. To be a Christian is to realize that in your sin, you were separated from God's presence, and you deserve nothing but God's wrath. Yet despite your darkness and in your deadness, his light shone on you, his voice spoke to you, inviting you to follow him. His majesty captivated your soul, and his mercy covered your sin, and by his death he brought you to life. Do you know for sure that you are his child? Not ultimately because of any good you have done, any prayer you have prayed, steps you have taken, or box, boxes you have checked, but solely because of the grace he has given you through Jesus Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father, we are challenged today just to be mindful that we can like the Christians in Sardis, we can, be, we can appear to be alive, but because of the sin that's unrepented of in us, we can, be walking, we can be walking dead people. Father, I thank you that you say in the letter, there are people that are dead, but there are also people who are walking with me, and they are dressed in white, and I've written their name in the book of life. Father, help us to call out to you today to receive your forgiveness and to know that you have written our name in your book of life and nothing can erase it. We thank you for this time and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing just uh, two verses of Breathe on Me, Breath of God. And if you would desire prayer today, you're welcome to come forward. There'll be a deacon uh, up, up front that uh, if you don't come forward during the song, they'll be available to pray with you afterwards. And then also remember, after we sing and the benediction, there, <laughs> there's a, a meal, there's a lunch for 40, so uh, it, it, it's incredible food, and I would encourage some of you to head, head that way, and we'll enjoy a table of life impromptu. So let's stand, and we'll sing together. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me. If you have a question or a concern or just you'd like to talk to someone about a situation in your life, Barb is Barb's up front here and she'd love for you to kind of make, make your way to her as, uh, as you're leaving. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.